Uh, kia ora, Bulavanaka, and welcome to this uh, final session, session four uh, at the Pacific Indigenous Peoples and Climate Crisis Workshop uh, Lessons from the Front Lines. Um, our uh, session today is on persons in vulnerable and marginalized situations. Um, my name is is Catherine Murupainga Aiken. I come from the Ngati Kuri and Te Rarua Māori peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I am a uh, Senior Indigenous and Minorities Fellow uh, with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights Regional Office for the Pacific. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session, uh, Shane Antonio, National Human Rights Officer at the OHCHR Regional Office for the Pacific. And so I hand over to you now, Shane. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Catherine. And uh, welcome back to our participants, both here uh, in the room and also online. Uh, this is our uh, last lap, so to speak, uh, graveyard shift after lunch. But I'm pretty sure with the um, interesting topics that we've discussed uh, and this uh, save the, the best for last, um, we will have um, not only in-depth, uh, but also quality discussions. Eh? Um, as mentioned, I'll be your, your moderator for today. And uh, the last session is uh, Persons in Vulnerable and Marginalized Situations. We have um, um, Mr. Ray, who, who is with us online. He will uh, present first, um, followed by uh, Rudy Senikula, uh, Vika, uh, and then we'll end with uh, Elikini. Um, as in the other sessions as well, uh, we'll save our questions till the end of the presentations. Uh, so please make a note of them. Uh, for those of us in the room, we'll have the first opportunity to ask uh, or also comment. And then I'll pass the mic on to my colleague, uh, Heyun, who will then um, ask any questions from our online uh, presenters as well. Eh? Uh, so without uh, any further ado, I welcome our first uh, speaker, Ray. Mary Ray, over to you. Bulavinaka, and thank you, Shane. Uh, thank you, the organizers, and uh, uh, special greetings to all the audience listening through from Sova and uh, on Zoom. I'm not in Maori, and uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me from where you are? Yes. All right, sweet. So I'm, re I'm really sorry. I'm uh, at the location where the internet is not so good, so please bear with me. Uh, so thank you guys for the opportunity uh, to share with you guys some of our stories from uh, the front line. And uh, the presentation today, I'll be uh, sharing about who I, uh, sharing a bit about myself. And I'll also be sharing uh, three case studies. Uh, one is the Banaban story of forced relocation and some of the lessons learned from these indigenous uh, people of Banaban. Uh, the second case study uh, would look at uh, the future of all nations at the edge of climate crisis. Uh, and this case study is from Kiribati. Uh, the third case study would look at some of the resilience building for the Kiribati migrants that brought me out there. And then I'll, uh, I'll conclude uh, the presentation. So uh, I am a member of the Pacific Youth Council Technical Advisory Group. The Pacific Youth Council is the longest uh, serving regional youth organization which serves 12 national youth councils in the South Pacific. Uh, Kiripas, uh, where I'm from, uh, uh, has an observer status within the Pacific Youth Council. Uh, I'm also engaged uh, actively uh, in the displacement and migration uh, technical working groups. Uh, one of the latest is the Global Compact on Migration uh, which I'm part of uh, through the affiliation with the Piango, which is the regional body for non-government organizations and the Pringo Alliance. Uh, uh, I've been with the NGO sector, particularly uh, with the young people, the, the youth, uh, for about 10 years now. Uh, I just returned from uh, Auckland, New Zealand, where I, where I spent five years uh, studying uh, towards social work. Uh, I've now completed my studies and I'm uh, on my way back to Kiribati. But uh, 
some of the engagement in Kiribati was the, the founding of uh, the Kiribati Island Corruption Kickers Network, as well as the Kiribati National Youth Associations for, for non-government organizations, and the establishment of the Kiribati Sotero Diaspora Directorate while I, won, while I was studying in New Zealand, and the Auckland Banaban Christian Fellowship Support Hub. So I am Banaban and I Kiribati uh, with uh, a dual citizenship because of the history of our people, which I would share on the first case study. So in 1945, uh, the Barnabans, uh, the Barnabans are for, uh, were forcefully relocated uh, because their, their lands were uh, destroyed because of phosphate mining. And as a result, they were relocated uh, to an island they bought from uh, loyalties, uh, from the phosphate loyalties, 2,000 kilometers north of Fiji Islands, which, which is called Rambi. Uh, it's been the 76th year now since they arrived in Fiji from Banaba, but some of the, the, the lessons learned from this migration of these indigenous people is that when you move a mass population uh, to another country, uh, you need to move them as a group because that's how they would be able to retain the language and cultures. Uh, the other lesson learned in terms of uh, the entrenchment of uh, policies and laws under two different governments has also had negative impacts on, on, on this uh, group of people uh, because, of course, uh, there would be a minority group where they, they would need to really navigate their way around, uh, you know, a macro environment where they can take up uh, 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 development aspirations in a new country where they, they resettled. And that has been a challenge for uh, these people on, on, uh, on Rambi in Fiji. Uh, it has been a struggle to actually uh, in, in integrate uh, a social economic development into a, a broader uh, a jurisdiction or, a, or within a constitution. So until today, uh, the Barnabans of Rambi have got a Barnabans Settlement Act of 1970s, where they are a self-governing uh, uh, local government within the, uh, the Fijian government. So uh, in, uh, it's been 76 years, and as the result of that entrenchment into a, a bigger country, uh, uh, we've had a lot of advantage, but some of uh, the disadvantage can be felt or seen within the social, economic, and well-being indicators. So the uh, access to health, education, and so forth. So they have been, uh, these indigenous population uh, have also had other elements of their, of what constitutes them as a people. Uh, and as indigenous people, much of that has been eroded because of this forced relocation. Uh, the second case study, uh, and this is the relationship between phosphate mining and climate change, why I've used the tool. So the tool has really been driven because of profits and capitalism, uh, colonialism, uh, power, and as the result of phosphate mining, which is uh, environment degradation, people have had to, to be forced, forcefully removed from, from, the, from, the, from the land because it's no longer inhabitable. And so these would be the same story uh, for low-lying atoll nations like Kiribati, Tuvalu, Tokelau. If the same countries who contributed to the mining uh, take bolder actions to mitigate climate change, uh, I think uh, people would not have to move in the future because they can then, uh, they, they can readapt and adapt to, you know, their country. And so forced relocation because of climate change, you know, how do we really prepare ourselves uh, when, when, when sea level rises and people have to move? Because so far, there hasn't been any internal displacement. Uh, so at some point in the future, you know, people may have to move across the borders. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a chaos. And, and that's the interrelationship between story of people who have already moved 
and you know people have not moved like how do we do a, a really good projection to inform policies that can help indigenous population thrive in a new environment and in a new country so how do we kind of marry the two learn from people that people who have already moved as well as do some bit of projection but then it won't do justice to young people who are not even born so those are the the comparison that i wanted to make and uh, during my time in New Zealand, I've had the uh, wonderful opportunity to work with the Kiribati Otero diaspora in uh, Walkworth, Rodney. And three years of uh, my engagement with this community or Kiribati community in New Zealand, you know, COVID-19 came last year. Uh, and it was massive because what COVID-19 did is that it showed all the loopholes and the weakness of policies and legislations to say that it cannot even look after our people who are there on temporary visas. So there is that issues around visas, uh, uh, issue around access to well-being services. In saying that, uh, people who are on uh, RSC uh, scheme visa, uh, regional seasonal employment uh, visas, or on uh, temporary visas, they cannot access the same. Uh, uh, they cannot access services that a normal resident of the country can access. And so there's the, the issue around equity. Uh, safety, uh, safeness, that has been a, a huge problem with our community in, uh, in Otero, New Zealand. But uh, we've been fortunate that the government of New Zealand was really proactive around trying to serve the needs of these communities via the Ministry for Pacific People. And so it's that uh, question around if, if there's to be a displacement to happen in the future, uh, are we prepared for it? Or is the host country prepared for it? Uh, so some of the projects we've done so far in, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand uh, is about, uh, you know, trying to claim, uh, trying to create a, a space for our, our Kiribati communities through a project that we initiated with Kiribati Sotero Diaspora Directorate uh, called the Kiribati Integrated Money at the Project. We've also set up a Kiribati Helpline for the first time uh, since our Kiribati people started moving to New Zealand. And I think that was one of the COVID-19 responses uh, because uh, a lot of our people did not understand language, uh, uh, you know, especially the elderly. So we, we felt that uh, we needed to establish this helpline so that services can reach our people through basic understanding of what's there and what's offered. We've also done a lot of language projects. This is to revitalize uh, the language because language is part of an indigenous person. And that's the main thing that would be affected if people leave their, their home countries. And so we've done a lot of uh, books. We digitize, we are now digitizing language resources. And we are now also focusing on doing a lot of migrant uh, wraparound services and advocacy programs so that we can reach out to our communities who are most vulnerable in the face of migration uh, as of now is because of economic migration. But it's just to show that uh, some of our host countries are not prepared. So this is a, a, an example of the work that we do. You can set it up online. Uh, a lot of links and videos are there. Uh, this was the books that we launched, and this is the structure of uh, the Clippers Integrated Maneva Project, uh, which is a place we wanted to call home because the Maneva, the meeting house, is something that we can connect to still maintain those beautiful cultures of, uh, you know, uh, different Clippers cultures within the, the Maneva, and and how that can happen. The building itself can harbor and can. Uh, become a safe nest for cultures and for peoples and people moving into New Zealand. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've not run out of time, but there needs to be stronger policies and legislations for protection of migrants using lessons learned from communities who have already experienced displacement and not from just mere approximation and protections because it will never do justice for people who are not even born, who have not even experienced across the border migration. There needs to be a clear definition of climate-induced migrant as opposed to climate refugee, because as of now, it seems like the climate refugee 
agenda is shaping what the climate induced migrant is going to be like in the future. And the, the, difference, the difference between the two is that climate induced migrant is caused by, you know, climate change. And at some point of time, would always love to go back home. With climate refugees who are dominating this space, it's mainly people who have had to flee their home because of political instability, wars, and so forth. They cannot go home, but with the Pacific people, the connection with our land as indigenous people, strong that always calls us to go back home. And so the last one is to have a clear pathway for migrants who choose to return home. So while we focus on people and communities who are going to go across the border because of uh, climate change, there's always other people that want to go back home, young people like us. I'm passing up for your time, and if you have questions, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ray, for, for that very in-depth uh, presentation. Um, raised a lot of important points um, and, and valid as well. Eh? And I guess um, for me, I, you know, some of the things that I take from it is, um, you know, mobility, climate-induced um, uh, mobility. So whether we're doing um, cross-border or in many of our Pacific Island countries uh, as, as a result of, uh, you know, cyclones and climate change, a lot of that is already happening um, in country. So how do we as indigenous people uh, shape the way in which our policies protect, I guess, eh? uh, and uphold our human rights um, as a community uh, when we are on the move as well. Eh? So thank you very much, Ray. Um, and I'll call upon our next uh, presenter, Ruthie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ruthie Senikula and I am with the Pacific Disability Forum as one of the program officers. And um, thank you very much for this opportunity to be presenting to you today. Next slide, please. <laughs> so uh, the Pacific Disability Forum is a regional organization of and for persons with disabilities. And uh, as you can see, our vision is an inclusive and equitable Pacific society where human rights of all persons with disabilities are realized under the UNCRPD. Uh, our membership, we have 40 full members that include uh, our DPOs or disabled persons organizations, 31 associate members. And all of these members are from 23 island countries within the Pacific region, including Australia and New Zealand. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a situational analysis of uh, one of the uh, pilot projects that we are conducting at PDF. Um, but before that, we also have a um, unit that looks after climate change uh, humanitarian work that's called the Preparedness Emergency and Response Unit. So we have a regional uh, coordinator on climate change that is looking after this project. And this project is looking at the impact of climate change on the lives of persons with disabilities in the Pacific. Um, phase one is to build impact or uh, evidence on the impacts of uh, climate change on and disasters of persons with disabilities. We are currently working with uh, three island countries that's Kiribati, Solomon Islands and Tuvalu. Uh, there are two project phases. Uh, phase one looks at uh, field study, literature interview, a literature review focus uh, group discussion and also the key informant interviews. And um, phase two will be determined by the results from phase one of the project. So this is a pilot project that uh, for PDF to conduct uh, a research on the impacts of climate change on persons with disabilities in the Pacific. Next slide. Um, so far, the field study has been completed. And uh, now we are in the process of compiling the findings. Um, after compiling the findings, we will have the validation of information uh, via Zoom with the, our DPOs in Kiribati, Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu before we launch the report. Uh, there was also a literature review that was conducted before the field study. 
So this is believed to be one of the first um, study that looks into climate change and persons with disabilities in the Pacific. Uh, so far, the review has found that uh, in the Pacific, uh, climate policies and programs uh, do not target the needs of persons with disabilities. And uh, also in the Pacific, uh, there is very little, not many migrants with disabilities. So persons with disabilities are also indigenous persons with disabilities in their own Pacific Island countries. And also there is very little movement of uh, these indigenous persons with disabilities in the Pacific uh, to allow for targeted programs on climate change. Yeah? Um, so the, re the field study will also capture information on indigenous persons with disabilities in these targeted countries. And this current work is supported by the DFAT uh, through Australia's Pacific Climate Program. Next slide. So uh, in the work that we do at PDF, we, um, we have the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with, with Disabilities that guide our work. And this, this convention has um, 50 articles and one of them is Article uh, 11, which is on the situation of risks and humanitarian emergencies. So as you can see, that is what the article uh, talks about, that uh, governments are obliged under international law, human rights law, and humanitarian law, uh, all necessary measures to ensure protection and safety of persons with disabilities in uh, armed conflict, emergency, humanitarian emergencies, and the occurrence of natural disasters. Yeah? Um, so one of the issues um, in climate change is internal displacement, uh, in partic particularly in the Pacific um, during natural disasters. And during displacement, uh, there is relocation into new communities. So whilst the idea is genuine and um, the practice is genuine for us here in the Pacific, this is uh, persons with disabilities are more isolated in the sense that the services do not relocate with the homes. So the services uh, can refer to the health services, the schools, um, the transportation services, uh, livelihood, et cetera. Uh, so this pushes them more um, into difficult situations leading to poverty. Um, and families, uh, while they relocate, some families uh, might come back to the original place that they lived in uh, for their livelihood. Eh? And, this, and this is very uh, challenging for persons with disabilities um, because uh, uh, they will be affected with these shifts due to uh, inaccessibility to transportation, um, and persons th uh, that need uh, persons with disabilities that need a 24/7 carer with them, persons who have uh, severe disabilities, uh, the the difficulties and the challenges that they face during relocation are doubled uh, due to accessibility to the new environment in terms of transportation and also inaccessibility to quality healthcare and so forth. Next slide. So these are some of our findings uh, from the project. So the implementation of uh, national policies without proper budgetary allocations and appropriate resources, and also the absence of preconditions to inclusion. Uh, so when we talk about preconditions to inclusion, uh, these are the conditions that need to be met first before or in order to allow for inclusiveness and equal participation of abilities at all levels. Eh? Um, for, so for when we talk about climate change, uh, the preconditions include non-discrimination in terms of having climate change policies uh, that also take into account the plight of persons with disabilities, uh, women and girls with disabilities, the provision of assistive devices, the availability 
offer support services such as personal assistance, and sign language interpreters, um, and also the social protection uh, introduced by the government uh, should be inclusive of the needs of persons with disabilities. And also that persons with disabilities are included in the community-based inclusive development programs. Next slide. Uh, and, and these are some of findings that we have managed to collect uh, from the project. Um, see some of the countries that have climate change uh, policies um, made reference to vulnerable groups, but there is no mention of uh, persons with disabilities. And also the relocation of uh, communities exacerbate the vulnerability of persons with uh, disabilities. Um, so, and also very little information to establish the plight of women and girls with disabilities in terms of loss and damage Im impacts. Um, as we know, loss and damage refers to the negative effects of climate variability and climate change that people have not been able to cope with or adapt to. Uh, due to the onset of uh, maybe sea level rise or disasters such as cyclones and hurricanes. Um, for persons with uh, disabilities, the examples of loss, in this case, uh, during natural disasters or climate change uh, would be maybe the loss of lives. Or, and when we talk about uh, disability, uh, it is um, the long-term physical, uh, intellectual, mental, and or uh, sensory impairment that which in inter interaction with other barriers may hinder full and effective participation of persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. Yeah? Um, another example uh, of loss would be um, maybe they used to live uh, um, near the river where women with disabilities would go and do their washing and because of uh, soil erosion or desalination of uh, rivers or, or landslides, uh, they, they, the village will need to maybe move up or move inland to maybe up the hill there's a stream or a different uh, place where they will be doing their washing. So this, this is um, for persons with disabilities, for women with disabilities, this is a great challenge because maybe it's inaccessible. Uh, maybe they live with uh, elderly people in their home. So who will help them to take up their washing, help them to bring it down the hill again for them to um, be living independently. Um, and this does not only apply to persons with disabilities, also for pregnant women and the elderly. Um, so for example, when the, for elderly that acquire their disability during uh, disasters or the impact of uh, climate change, uh, the ability to perform their usual tasks before they acquire their disability is now, um, is now uh, a challenge. So all these factors may, not, may never be the same during adaptation and relief efforts. <clears throat> Uh, and damage for persons with disabilities uh, may refer to the damage of their assistive devices, such as their wheelchairs or their white canes, when they have to relocate uh, to a new place. Uh, maybe the damage of uh, footpaths around their surroundings, the, the damage of their houses and also their farms for their livelihood. Next slide. So these are some of the recommendations that we have come up with uh, to have budgetary, inclusive uh, budgetary allocations that take into account uh, persons with disabilities and their needs in any climate change programs. Uh, increase the level of capacity building for in climate change with for persons with disabilities. Um, and also uh, CSOs can part partner with disabled people organizations uh, to promote climate inclusive actions. Next slide. And also the invol involvement of persons with disabilities uh, in adaptation and mitigation programs as climate actors. So uh, 
while we may have good policies that mention disability, uh, the reality is that when this comes to implementation, those clauses are silent. So the disability components are not fully realized. Um, and uh, one of the uh, interesting information that we have also found while working on this project is that with regards to persons with disabilities, they experience climate change, but they don't know that those uh, experiences that they are facing is an impact of climate change. So I think it is important to increase the level of um, climate change awareness to persons with disabilities. Next slide. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again, um, uh, Rudy, for the presentation. Um, and we also um, wish you all the best with your research and we look forward to your research findings. Eh? Um, also an important point in terms of um, working with the, the conventions. Um, some of us might feel like, uh, you know, the work we do at the grass, grassroots level um, has no impact eh? uh, or is not linked to anything at a higher level, uh, but they actually uh, are. And I guess for us persons with indig uh, indigenous persons, uh, that's, that's also a good, um, uh, probably a good, you know, uh, indicate or take away for us. Eh? Um, there is something in place at the, at the international level for us as well. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Rudy. And I call upon our next uh, uh, speaker, Vika Naka. We have to do the breaking and building. We have to, to decide what it is we leave behind and what we take forward. By Noli Nambulivo. Good afternoon, Mbuluvinaka, everyone, and also those present here uh, physically and those that are online. My name is Vika Karukalo, or Kado is known by my workmates and friends. I work for Diva for Equality, for Diverse Voices and Accent for Equality. It is a local NGO, not like the UN. Uh, we are grassroots-led, feminist framing and human rights-based uh, uh, work that we do, and we operate here from Suba. We have nine uh, hubs around the country. We work with around 300 to 500 women from across Viti Levu, Pono Levu, Kandavu, Lau, and the Lama Iviti. For us, uh, for myself, uh, being the Diva for Equality Management Collective member, Indigenous LBT women, focal point for Women Builders Peer Support Group, Women Defend the Commons Network, and we also work with all women all people, all human rights, social, economic, ecological, and climate justice everywhere. So up here, this is our vision. As you can see, the all is repeated. For us, the all is important because it includes everyone. Being uh, indigenous and being born into a community as such is not easy. The expectation, roles, and responsibilities begin at, at an early age. Gender roles are introduced. Girl child began to care for the whole family, even though her herself needs caring. We are groomed, nurtured to suit a system that is unjust, hierarchy, and patriarchal. Of course, the system has sometimes favored us because of who we are, we indigenous. But most times, it has failed us. Indigenous communities even have a class within. We have a class system a male and a female, old and young, all women, young women, the color of your skin, dark or light or fairer, rich or poor, you are straight or you are LGBTQ, you have abilities or you have disabilities and many more. What is being indigenous when we have the highest rates of violence against women and girls here in Fiji? What is being indigenous when your mother is a widow and she has no right to land and property in the village than her own sons? What is being indigenous when your lesbian sister is raped or your gay brother is chased from the village because of their sexuality? Your sister-in-law is being told she has no say in the village meetings. Marginalized communities are being left out when there is food distribution and assistance in the village. Climate crisis also brings about ecological, economical, and social problems. When we have cyclone, we have evacuation centers, eh? So our diverse women, women, we have all diversity, they face um, violence, physical, mental, mental violence, 
a sexual violence and also emotional violence. So they sometimes are very fearful when they want to go to evacuation centers during cycle. So we need to look at the bigger picture. We are not indigenous people alone. We are fisherwomen, we are builders, we are mothers, we are wives, we are sons, we are daughters, we are LGBTQ members, we are sports person, we are graduate, we are professors, we are activists, we wear multiple hats. Climate crisis affects us all, left, right, and center. We are the least contributors to the problem, but we could be the major change. Recently, Fiji has been struck by one pandemic and three cyclones. Deaf of equality has been the frontline response to many villages and communities. LGBTQ community and youth volunteers has been, has been reaching out, distributing food rations, despite being discriminated and stigmatized. Fiji Women Builders Peer Support Group, a, a diverse group that started in 2018. So these are all women who are doing construction and carpentry course. So from 2018, 20 women graduated from APTC, Steve got to. They were able to build uh, 16 cyclone proof houses to withstand the change in climate that we are facing. Women in Builders has been renovating homes for women of all diversity of at risk and flood prone communities. They help repair a walking bridge for women and children in a maritime village. Being an LBT, being an Itoke, living in the maritime, women face far more worse climate situation because of the rising sea level, broken bridges by Cyclone Winston, and also damaging sea, level, sea walls. Despite going into the village, we negotiate because we're wearing swords to do the work. We have to follow protocol. Because, but because of our work is construction, we negotiate our power. Because of the standard of the course that we take, it is Australian standard, our safety is very important than the protocol. So we have to negotiate, we have to present one kg waka, and we have to be allowed to wear the swords. If not, the bridge in Kandava won't be built. So we were able to build a bridge within two weeks. So despite our sexuality, the way we cut our hair, the way we dress, we will manage to help the women and children because that was only the walking bridge that connects the village to the school. That bridge, two or three children have fallen off the bridge because of the pine, pine tree that they put temporarily just for them to walk. So now they were able to use the concrete bridge being built by the women builders. Introduction of aquaponics. Aquaponics is a pure organic low cost food barrel system for food security in terms of crisis. This is for sandy soil areas. This is if you're living in town, you don't have uh, more, more land. This is a, um, a system that could help you with the food security. Pure organic, you just need tilapia and also your vegetables. Diva for Equality have been working with around 300 women for around the country in moving their work in the villages and islands. Having to protect their natural resources land, forest, and ocean, their villages, and their islands. The for Equality has been supplying water tanks to cyclone-affected villages, reviving the dispensary in the villages. Nasini Kor, which was built in 1920s, women pay extra cost to go to the, to the main health center, 150 to hire, to hire the boat return, $200 for road transport for emergency. Imagine women, women living in the maritime and in the islands with no money and there's an emergency. So Diva for Equality right now is reviving the dispensary, the National Coral Station and the supplies by supplying the 200, 250 packs of medical supplies. Because when we go to the village, only one pack of ORS in the village, only one pack of Panadol. The investment and plan for nursery, for a nursery for endangered, endangered trees like Yasin, the Kua, and mahogany, the herbal medicine for women's group to nurture and transplant it when they're able to be transplanted, planting on mangroves on the coastline, maintaining healthy living, healthy living within our villages and communities. Women are hungry for information and knowledge on where to move from here. In this space to meet, 
to regroup, to plan, because they used to see the land, the forest, and environment to feed our families. They are the experts on the ground. So Dibu for Equality reached out to take the work out of Suba to the islands, to the villages, to the remote, so that they provide space, safe space for women to plan and move forward. We, uh, Dibu for Equality also support income generating business for LGBTIQ and marginalized community. During the pandemic, Diva has provided 150, uh, 1,500 meals, school love meals for students for six months whose parents are affected by the pandemic. This is in between four schools. We were not faced with violence in evacuation centers. Kids are hungry. Women in maritime face shortages of food, wash, and sanitation. The human in us has been taken lightly because the system has failed us. We are not doing this work. Not only we are indigenous, we are diverse. We are human. We, came, we care and support for each other. We work from a clean heart and from a place of love. We are doing it because someone has to do it. Putting the human rights at the center and at the urgency of the issue and reality. The right to life, the right to educate and safe housing, right to clean water, no poverty, right to healthy food, and safe and beloved communities, and many more. Indigenous identifying the gaps and connecting the work at grassroots level, national and regional, and of course, global level, engaging in social movement, this work is not easy. We need we need full participation of everyone. Engage in decision making, engage at village level meetings, district and all provincial levels. This fight starts with us. Material change has to come from us. If we need to move forward, we need to take the first step. Be engaged, be vocal, and keep fighting for the younger generation to also access what we have now. Beautiful oceans, enough land, big and healthy fish, safe, healthy and beloved community for them. How can we continue with the good work if the environment around us is breaking down? How can we fight if our Pacific is drowning? Change starts with you and me. We are together in this. If the system is not aligned with human rights and gender lens, we will still leave everyone behind. So let's leave no one behind. We need to work together so that we can be dangerous together. Pinaka. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Vika, for the presentation. And I think it, uh, it drills down to a lot of the things that we are discussing today. Um, you know, it speaks on systems. It speaks on um, us as indigenous peoples and also at the individual and community level. Uh, the reflection eh, that we have to do and the work that's, uh, that's needed of each and every one of us. But I think what uh, I like the most about that is the all. Eh? We're all in, this, all in this together and the work we need to do needs to ensure that everyone's involved uh, and included. Um, so with that, we now move on to our, um, our last speaker for this afternoon, um, Elikini Naka. Naka, Mbulere, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the previous speakers for the insights and uh, all their work that they have been doing in the community. And um, um, yeah, as a, um, I'm a member of the Mbo Urban Youth Network and um, a volunteer and also a student at the University of the South Pacific. Um, just uh, today, I will be just telling the stories of the past and our experience and uh, with no PowerPoint presentation. Um, sorry if uh, you have a lot of expectation. Um, um, yeah, just, just to um, dwell on the, the, the word indigenous and uh, uh, to ponder that for a moment, what does it reflect and says to us? Um, as indigenous people and not in the universal definition of what they said that we are marginalized um, minority groups, 
but let us bring the word closer to home. Uh, what it does is bring to us, like in the Pacific context, in our Fijian context, in our various community uh, context, the name indigenous, and uh, how we organize ourselves as a community, and uh, how we conduct ourselves in our various um, community and gatherings, how we communicate, how we do things, and um, yeah, those kind of things. Like it makes us stand apart. And uh, for us at Mbo Abinut, uh, it's something, it, it is an auto automated um, a system that, that it has an inbuilt thing that when disaster strike, we know what to do. And that it comes from being able to know who we are and our um, place in the community and our role in the community and identifying ourselves with the structure of the community that has been laid out well before we were born. And uh, I always um, like, well, there is a word that says our, that we are born into a future, to a world that is borrowed from our ancestors. And then, yeah, something like that. Um, and uh, through those lines, um, I would like to speak um, on a few of our experience as uh, indigenous people. And uh, mostly we use our professional experiences uh, in using our profession to help benefit the community. And uh, this has been um, evident in a few uh, happenings um, back at home, um, such as the bauxite mining in Noailebu, and also um, now that TC Yasa and TC Winston, um, the more, like uh, we choose to adopt our own roles in the community as traditional roles. So we let uh, all the leaders become uh, the head of our um, group and uh, the rest of us becomes the hands of leg and legs, just blending in using our own role. And in these ways, we managed to identify how we can address issues such as food security and um, you know, service delivery and uh, not really duplicating process, but standing in the gap, uh, standing in the gap of existing process and helping uh, bridge um, and uh, closing bridges, such as um, uh, improving in service delivery, capacity building programs and awareness. And uh, specifically, there was uh, one report that was done by our members, which is called the Wainunu Scoping Report in 2015. And this um, identifies some of, since we live in a um, um, uh, traditional setting, we do things commonly, like in communal uh, settings. Um, there was uh, some issues, a few issues that were identified from uh, our scoping report was uh, one which is a few food security issue. There, you, there was um, a gravel uh, mining that used to be done alongside the rivers in one of the villages. And then a few, there has been a generational practices of fishing uh, that is known in the village that used to be conducted for ages. And this, they, it, after, as a result of the gravel uh, extraction, it became extinct. All the feces that used to be fished has all of a sudden, this is in fresh water. They all of a sudden, like all vanished. And after a few years, the practice has not been practiced and carried on. And then yeah, these are things that happens in consensus uh, agreement well, when we live in villages settings and, and those things that, uh, and how we can adapt to ensure that we continue um, and practice sustainable practice uh, to, to the future. And um, uh, also I would like to highlight the impact of uh, uh, climate change in Long Air Village. Uh, they have been, there was a, a total of 18 villages that were totally washed out uh, as a, a result of uh, PCSA. And uh, during that, we, as we have been practicing over the past, uh, like 
all of a sudden, everyone just comes together, mobilize, we call each other, everyone donates, they use their own uh, networks, they bring in donation, and we all just go using our own um, um, uh, networks and resources that are available, whatever we have. And it's, it's just um, um, like, since we live in a community, it, it things, as I have said earlier, it happens like as an automated things, people, we don't force people to come and donate, like everyone just come out willingly. So it's like a sense of community that exists in us. So it may like looking along those lines and um, looking to the future, how can we um, uh, adapt and um, also bringing closer the, the, the Pacific definition of um, indigenous people and to ensure that we have accessibility, service delivery and resource mobilization, bringing all and identifying development partners who would come and identify with it with us to ensure that our communities um, maintain um, safe and uh, sustainable way of living without much disruption. I think with those few words, I would uh, leave it um, with um, um, you guys. And I thank you all for this opportunity. <laughs> Vinaka uh, Ilikini. Um, now that we've uh, completed the presentations from our panelists, I, I believe we do have some questions. Um, do you have any questions? We have, I think we have questions on the chat box. All right, uh, here and we'll read them out and then we'll come back to uh, the floor. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shane. Um, I'll I'll pose one question for now from Willie Misak. What are the current policies in the Pacific Islands, small islands and beyond to accommodate the climate migrant? Is there, are there any policies in the Pacific to address the climate induced migrants? Another question from Willie Misak. So based on research, the research, what are some reasons to why there are less movement or displacement of people with disabilities? Thank you for the question. Um, I believe, I think it could be due to um, <clears throat> those, uh, the preconditions to inclusion that I have mentioned uh, in my presentation. For example, uh, um, accessibility. Accessibility uh, and accessibility, when you talk about accessibility, we're not only looking at accessibility to information, but also accessibility to transportation and accessibility to ICT and also accessibility to information. So maybe, um, maybe uh, and also the climate uh, policies that are not uh, inclusive of persons with disabilities. Uh, this could be some of the factors uh, of uh, the less movement of persons, uh, indigenous persons with disabilities. Um, and I also, and I also have here with me our regional coordinator on climate change, who would also like to contribute. Um, thank you, Ruth. Um, my name is Saini Milito Wake. And um, the, the, the one of the main reasons just to give a straightforward answer is because of disability. That was one of, or that is one of the main reason uh, for very little movement or a realloc a relocation of persons with disabilities. And also the other that uh, Ruth had mentioned is the policy. So we have uh, in every country, there's migration policies and disability is not reflected in there. And we have some beautiful stories that will come out in our report, uh, not beautiful, but dynamic, uh, that will come out of our report that talked about the, the challenges persons with disabilities face um, when they try and migrate uh, because of uh, climate change. Um, but yes, the, the policy is very silent or some of the migration laws are very silent 
uh, on disability and that hinders a lot. And many times persons with disabilities are separated from their families just because of that. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Uh, and Ruthie, uh, I, I believe there's a question from the floor. Is there any questions from the room? Thank you. Uh, my first question was actually was supposed to be asked to, since Ray is no longer online, I'm just going to throw it back to my lovely dear cousin sitting at the back here. Uh, if um, um, if Rudy or Sai could just um, give a brief onto the prospect of what they have explained in their presentation, and if you can just throw it up again, please. Um, just highlighting a few points that I took from uh, the presentation that uh, Rudy had shared, mainly affected onto the prospect of disability. When the government issued the statement about the five meter, uh, was it five meter distance? What? one meter distance, one meter to two meter distance, one meter to two meter distance. So understanding disability, as Rudy had mentioned, um, there's different types of disability. Now concerning the disability prospect of um, a person that, that requires a carer 24 seven, this really triggered a lot into the prospect of how, how could the government uh, or did even the government think about this um, uh, this aspect when they came up with this uh, with this with this law or with this yes um, so if uh, Sai can just um, highlight a few points on that or Ruthie thank you thank you for the question um, so when are you referring to the COVID pandemic. Okay, so when the COVID pandemic uh, hit us last year, I can remember the date very well on March 19. And so um, we, uh, persons with disabilities were, even myself, Sai, and other colleagues of ours, when those um, preventative measures, yeah? when those preventative measures came out, and one of them was on social distancing, that is difficult for persons with disabilities to practice. And uh, it's much more difficult for those that have, um, th those that need a carer on a 24-7 basis. Yeah? So we had uh, to come up with, uh, we came up with uh, um, a lot of research online and also uh, WHO had stepped in to fund uh, the COVID-19 project, which, um, and so uh, in that case, for persons with disabilities that uh, have a full-time carer, first and foremost, their carers need to be aware of, of protecting themselves first before they can protect the person that they are looking after. They need to always wash their hands frequently before they go and uh, help uh, the person with disability to wash their hands. Um, they, they need to clean up surfaces, regularly touched surfaces, where they where uh, that they touch, and also where persons the person the person with disability will be at. So, um, in the the carers and family members, they need to be aware that they just don't go and um, um, say to persons with disabilities, "Come, you need to wash your hands often. After you eat, wash your hands. After you touch that, wash your hands." They need to practice it first before uh, so that they are able to keep themselves and the person with disability protected at all times. Um, so I have two questions. Um, so when the Barnabans moved to Rambi, um, were there people already living there? I mean, I, I think we had people living there and they had to move because they had to move in. That was my first one. I just wanted to get clarification around that. And the second one was, were there any transitioning phase whereby the Kiribati communities underwent trainings to assist them when they finally entered New Zealand? Uh, this is, I think this one is speaking specifically on sustainability, whether they were able to look after themselves when they had moved into New Zealand. Thank you. Um, I, I guess for, for the questions that, um, that you've posed, for the ones that we can't uh, get our panelists online at the moment, um, we'll try our best to link up with uh, with Ray. Um, these are some of the questions that we can unpack uh, later as well. Eh? 
Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, I'm just gonna put it on on as well with Ray on a pause right now, and then if he can answer it later when he can. Um, just uh, regarding his presentation in terms of migration of the Kiribati, um, my question is just surrounding the psychosocial support in terms of migration. Was there any psychosocial support in terms of mental health and the effects in terms of this traumatizing event of them leaving their homes to start off in a new environment where, which is totally new to them. So that is a question to pause and to Ray. And I'm just gonna throw it back to Ruthie and Sai. Now, in terms of social protection and community development, now you spoke on uh, one of uh, the uh, CRDP, um, in, uh, that is on Article 11, which involving government. Now, um, my work as a human rights activist and a human rights defender, um, speaking on the term of disability, it really intrigues me a lot. Now, um, from I just would like, if you if you can, or if you can, um, clear, uh, if you can just explain on the perspective uh, on the involvement of government and or. I'd say any stakeholder in terms of uh, social protection and community development surrounding disability. Uh, and lastly, on um, 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 yes, lastly, you spoke on policy. Now, a lot of policy has come up. I've read policies that that states an inclusion of disability. Now, as disability rep. Uh, frankly, to ask. So, when these policies are actually drafted up, were there really representation or were there represent representatives from the disability forum sitting in this um, in, in this forum of drafting the policy, or was this just written saying disability inclusion in terms of policy statements? Uh, one thing to look back as well is working in humanitarian uh, humanitarian ground. Um, in terms of checklist, there isn't any to be franked. I don't know if, if there's any government uh, uh, stakeholder in, uh, in the room right now, but to be frank, there isn't any. If that's something as well that uh, UN Human Rights can look into when we're talking about humanitarian work um, in terms of climate action, if that's something as a recommendation, um, as uh, by the um, by mentioned by my colleague sitting of, uh, on my side here that if we're if we're going to be working with all so if that's something that we can all work together not only putting it in writing that there yes there's disability there if we can actually have the physical representatives from this these vulnerable groups and these vulnerable communities be present to speak their own mind share their own story rather than just putting it there in paper. So I'm just going to put it back to Sai and Rudy. If you can just share your experience on this, please. Thank you. Uh, for social protection, uh, currently in the Pacific, there are governments that have social protection programs that include persons with disabilities. And there are uh, some that 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 is beginning to work on it. Uh, for example, here in Fiji, we have uh, the poverty benefit scheme we have that include persons with disabilities. We have a specific disability allowance for persons with disabilities that they receive on a monthly basis, which is $90. And um, for Nauru, they have a they have a social protection of $200. Uh, that uh, persons with disabilities, 200 Australian dollars that persons with disabilities receive as part of social protection. And there are, and also Kiribati and Samoa. There are other uh, Pacific Island countries that, that is, uh, um, I'm sorry, Samoa is, is starting to work on their social protection. Um, they are having discussions with the government on what they feel or they feel, yeah, they feel that should be included as part of social protection for persons uh, with disabilities. And my colleagues, I will elaborate more. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I guess 
uh, for the other part of the question, uh, yes, we have policies. There's lots of policies in the Pacific that says include persons with disabilities, but it comes in silo, standalone, and there has never been any. You can just see it in, for example, disability is mentioned or grouped with other vulnerable groups, but I would just like to reiterate here that uh, persons with disabilities are not vulnerable. It's the, the situation that makes people vulnerable. So they don't like, or we don't like uh, to be called, we are part of the vulnerable group. Uh, and again, so many policies that I've read when we were doing literature review, yes, I agree, mentioned only disability and there has never been a, a, a more clarification or more, uh, you know, substantive, uh, you know, substantive directions or guide. And it's because when people with disabilities are there in the room and we are tired of this, because sometimes it's just a tick in the box. You are there, but how much uh, of our voices are being taken into consideration and how much does it count? And it's said to say that all these policies that we were looking at, Fiji may have a good one, but again, the implementation is another thing. Thank you. Is there any questions online? Okay, there's one last question from Willie Misak. Uh, to the last presenter, what did they think are the, what does the last presenter think is a missing component in the climate policy to address the need of the grassroots base on their, from their experiences? Thank you. Um, I think um, uh, the, in Fiji currently in uh, Tongia, uh, there is a called a plan relocation guidelines. And uh, currently, they're still developing SOPs for uh, um, the community, and uh, and they are just using past experience. So there is no, um, and mostly these are used for stakeholders and development partners and other um, groups. But there are no specific guidelines for the community on what to do um, in relocation and in these kind of instances where, where the, um, there's a natural disaster and um, uh, there are processes involved, such as uh, uh, in this case, uh, like uh, we visited last week, uh, and um, they have identified a site and they have already cut down the trees and whatnot, cleared the um, um, bush. And uh, after the um, um, visitation of the Ministry of uh, mineral resources and then when they assess the area it was not safe for them to relocate to so they there was already some damages done there was a lot of trees cut down and all these things so currently there is an there is no uh, standard um, process for the community uh, like a set of guidelines for them to use so that is some area that um, maybe um, uh, that can be improved and um, for, yeah, for the community um, interest to be safeguarded. No. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Um, and I guess uh, this, okay, one last question. I'm oh, sorry, Shane. I'm just gonna add on to what uh, Kimi had um, highlighted to earlier. The, the missing component is not allowing the indigenous people to sit in the room and have a conversation with stakeholders. Due diligence, I mean, we're, most of the times we're not part of this process and that, and, and that I think is the most important missing component. And it's not, a, um, yes, as to add on to what um, Ini has said, the thing is it's equal participation having representative from youth, women, girls, and the marginalized community, and towards the, the representatives from the disability um, of um, groups as well. And that actually, that is the missing component towards climate, um, uh, climate uh, uh, section. I'm just referring to Willie's question. So adding again to their comments, reiterating again, the inclusion of all persons, uh, uh, and and I, and I just want to emphasize again with with this uh, presentation and uh, and size feedback of all persons with uh, disability, uh, people with intellectual disability, you know, people with 
Down syndrome, autism, multiple disability, people with psychosocial disability that people usually stigmatize and call them Lili and Pagla and all those words, you know, they really need to participate equally along with their support persons and their families. They need to be at that platform and they need to be heard. They also need to be valued. And as Diva shared, they contribute to sustainable livelihood as well. They have talents and gifts and abilities, and they are indigenous people in our communities. Thank you. Uh, and I guess with that, we bring this session to an end. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation, your questions, and your comments. Uh